Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Instrumental Intel. I am your host, music producer at Chick with Beats, and I'm glad that you've joined me today. I've got a show for you lined up with music industry news, beats by me for your inspiration. And later, I've got a special guest coming to join me, DJ E House, talking about vibe checks from behind the decks, breaking new music, and so much more. So I'm excited to be bringing this episode to you. And so before I go ahead and drop that first beat, I want to give a shout out to my home station, Grander Radio out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And with that, let's go.
with the music biz brief. First up, TikTok has ended relicensing talks with Merlin, the indie music rights group, ahead of their deal's expiration on October 31st. Instead of a collective agreement, TikTok is encouraging individual Merlin members to negotiate direct deals. The platform raised concerns about the legitimacy of some music from Merlin, citing manipulated versions of copyrighted tracks. TikTok's decision comes as the industry faces growing issues with streaming fraud, a problem Merlin says it's actively addressing. Independent labels must sign new deals with TikTok by October 25th to avoid disruptions starting November 1st. Next, YouTube and CSAC, the performing rights organization, have resolved a licensing dispute that led to the removal of music videos by artists like Adele and Kendrick Lamar in the U.S. YouTube blocked some content after failing to renew their deal, but later reached a new agreement to compensate CSAC songwriters and publishers fairly. The platform began restoring the affected videos, and CSAC thanked its affiliates for their patience during the negotiation. Spotify's global head of music, Jeremy Ehrlich, is stepping down to pursue his own entrepreneurial ventures. He will remain in an advisory role at Spotify until February 2025. He joined the company in 2019 and became the global head of music in 2021 after a successful career at Interscope Records and Universal Music Group. Ehrlich's responsibilities will transition to David Kafer, Spotify's VP of Music and Audiobook Business. Key team members will continue reporting to Kafer. In other news, Pink Floyd has sold their recorded music catalog to Sony Music in a deal reportedly worth around $400 million. The agreement includes the band's recordings, neighboring rights, and name and likeness rights, but does not cover publishing rights. This purchase follows Sony's earlier acquisition of Queen's music rights for over $1 billion. Pink Floyd's catalog has been on the market since 2022, with the sale attracting interest from several major companies. The band's recorded music continues to generate significant revenue, with $50 million earned in the last fiscal year. Alright, next story, independent music continues to drive innovation with advocacy groups like the American Association of Independent Music leading the charge. A mid-year report by Luminate shows a 15% growth in on-demand audio streaming in 2023, with indie artists gaining market share. Indie musicians made up 62.1% of artists with 1 to 10 million U.S. streams in early 2024. However, the A2IM president notes that mid-level artists are still struggling, especially with touring. New legislation, including the Create Art Act, aims to support emerging artists with federal grants, while A2IM continues to advocate for indie musicians on issues like AI and fair ticketing. And finally, Leslie Fram, CMT's Senior VP of Music Strategy and Talent, has stepped down after 13 years, following Paramount Global's layoffs that heavily impacted the network. A major force in country music, Fram oversaw programming across CMT's platforms and was instrumental in launching initiatives like Next Women of Country, promoting over 100 female artists. Her farewell letter highlights her pride in CMT's efforts to foster inclusion and diversity. As CMT faces an uncertain future with significantly reduced staff, as in there's only 10 people that remain at the network, Fram's departure marks a significant moment for the country music community. So yes, all the changes in staff, uh, companies laying people off, that trend continues, or with people leaving. So yeah, there's definitely some things going on in the industry and, you know, hey, we just gotta keep up with what's going on. The entertainment and tech sectors have been seeing a lot of hard hits lately, and so we're starting to see that kind of trickle down. And so, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see where things may be going. So, you know, keep your head up, stay informed, keep doing what you do. All right, and that's it for this week's Music Biz Brief. I'm gonna take a quick pause for the cause, and then I'll be back with my special guest, super dope DJ, E-House. Keep it locked.
Hey, I'm a chick with beats, multi genre music producer, and strategist to indie artists and labels. Visit a chick with beats.com for resources for artists and instrumentals in various genres available for songs, blogs, blogs, podcasts, themes, TV, film, commercials, and more. Once again, that's a chick with beats.com. That's A C H I C K W I T B E A T Z.com. Let's make something happen. Thank you so much for tuning in to Instrumental Intel. I am your host, music producer, Chick with Beats. And I'm excited to say that I have in the virtual building with me today, DJ E-House. Um, it's been a while. You've been a guest on the uh, old radio show, Music Marvels. But since this is your first time here on Instrumental Intel, I'd like for you to kind of let the people know a little bit about who is DJ E-House and how you got started with DJing. Okay, yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, like my name's E House. I've been doing this uh, DJ thing uh, for a long time since 1985. That was my first paying gig, and so um, just been DJing um, and kind of all over the board. You know, I've done the whole college scene, doing a lot of the frats and stuff, and uh, back in the like late 80s, early 90s, actually mid 90s on uh then i ran a nightclub for about four or five years in kalamazoo michigan it's called club soda um and we had a night on tuesdays which we call club 340 and that went on actually i i ran it for like five years and then it continued on for a couple of years after i moved away um but that was kind of a big adventure and learning curve and i moved to phoenix arizona um in 1990 eight and it took me about a year or so to find the scene here in phoenix but uh did find that house music scene that i love the most but the hip-hop scene here is also phenomenal um, we have i would argue some of the best hip-hop djs in the world mm -hmm. are actually here because uh, we have guys here that regularly tour you know overseas uh europe japan all of that and they're right here based on phoenix uh, so that's kind of what I've been doing here off and on in between my actual career, uh, my job, and I work for a major airline, but still DJing, still love it. Um, it's just one of those things, once it gets under your skin, you just, the music, you can't help it. Mm. So that's a little about me. Okay, well, thank you for that. And, you know, I should have said before we even began, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with us. But um, yeah, you mentioned your, oh, no your first paying gig was in 1985. What did that feel like to you mm -hmm. instead of somebody just like, yo, can you do this? <laughs> but to actually pay you for it. Yeah, it was uh, it was funny because it was a house party <laughs> first. But, you know, I remember hauling all of my equipment. And this was actually, um, I did not have a car at the time. So mm. I literally was walking because it was in the same complex that I lived in. Um, and so it was another friend's house, but yeah, um, his mom wanted a party and I was like, I'll do it. And yeah, she paid me. It wasn't a lot of money. It was about a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Even in 1985, that was a lot of money. Yeah. It got me a lot of records. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was fun. It was one of those things. It was the time I felt legit because I wasn't just doing someone a favor. So yeah, that had to feel pretty good. And uh, like you said, it's not be doing a favor. I mean, it's so many, uh, I guess, producer, producers, DJs, even artists are offered that just, you know, for the exposure thing. But, you know, to get uh, valued that early, that had to feel really good. Yeah, it was. Um, it was actually neat because back then, obviously, there was no internet. Um, your only true exposure was doing doing the party and being on the flyer mm -hmm. and and that you know and i you know had some uh, mentors that i actually got to play with but they you know i was playing early i was getting that just that basic knowledge but yeah once i got paid and it, it helped like i said about getting records and things like that being able to buy more equipment um but it did help with my um confidence of you know being okay with asking you know for this is how much i'm charging um, I was I came up in I think in a very fortunate time where there wasn't a lot of promoters. It was literally you were going straight to the people who were throwing the party, um, that fraternity or whatever, or that organization um, having the party. 
And so there was no no promoter at a nightclub hiring you as the middleman for the nightclub owners. Mm -hmm. I literally was hired like when I worked at the club directly with the owners of the nightclub. I, in effect, became the promoter. Um, so yeah, it's, it was it's a lot different than it was than it is now. So yeah, it was it was a good experience. Okay, and you know. House Party is one of my favorite movies. And when you were talking about how you didn't have a car and you had to foot it over there before you said that it was the same complex, I just had this image of, you know, Bilal getting in there and trying to get all the records in and all that stuff. <laughs> Do you remember uh, like what some of the albums were that you copped like once you got paid for that? Like, is oh, there anything that kind of sticks my out? God. <laughs> well, like early records for me, um, Man, it was it's it's so much. It, it, I always say that I've forgotten about more music than, than people probably will <laughs> ever know. Um, but like even then, because the first paying gig was in '85, but I had been playing music and, and buying records since like early '80s. Um, so I was you know big on you know Planet Rock, anything out of Detroit, Detroit techno scene, anything that came mm -hmm. on Metroplex Records. So that was Derek May, Juan Atkins, Kevin Saunderson. Uh, those guys, um, of course, I was early on the scene with the Chicago house thing. And that was the unique thing about growing up where uh, we both are yeah. from Kalamazoo is we we're located halfway in between Detroit and Chicago. So we got this dual experience of the Detroit techno scene and the Chicago house scene. Yeah. So it was that. But then it was also the R&B stuff, Earth, Wind and Fire, all of that, Frankie Beverly and Mays, all those things, too, because some of the parties I would do were for you know, for all intents and purposes, adults. Mm -hmm. So at the time, you know, I'm in my teens and I'm going to party for, you know, 25 year olds and up too. <laughs> and so that was, you know, a pretty cool thing. So, yeah. So you had an old soul like back in the day, man, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I grew up in that generation of every Saturday, mom's making you do, you know, your, your chores. Yeah. And on Saturdays, you're doing the chores and you're listening to watching Soul Train. You have to, you have to and, you know, growing up, unfortunately, in Kalamazoo, we didn't have black radio, right. so it was we relied on a lot of tapes from our family and friends who would either send them to us or when we would go visit family in Chicago or Detroit, I'm recording everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got got a got a wide exposure there. That's that's I, and I again love that experience, but then also was fortunate to have older aunts and uncles. Um, who are all in the music business somewhere, somehow. Like I've got a, a, a uncle James that's a good singer. I got a um, uncle Maurice who's a brilliant keyboardist and drummer. And I have uh, Aunt Janice who is also a really good singer. And so they were all into that music scene too. And so that helped with me getting that kind of broader horizon. And then it didn't hurt that like my mom was into jazz at the time. My stepdad uh, was a jazz saxophonist. So he was in a band, always in a band of some sort going on back then. So yeah, it was it was a great experience. And that's why I think I still have, like the taste of music that I have today is so broad. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just one thing. You know, I do prefer house music when I'm DJing, but I can play hip hop, I can play R&B, I can do all those things. Mm -hmm. It all translates. <laughs> all right, so it's just in you, like, yeah, from blood and just ingrained yeah. in you, like that's what's up. So yeah. you mentioned I was that kid growing. Up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was saying I was that kid growing up that you know for Christmas instead of asking for toys, I was asking for records. Mm -hmm. So that that'll show you how much like, and that was from a young kid. Okay, for sure. That's what's up. So yeah, you mentioned earlier about um, you know DJ and a club soda and. Unfortunately, you know, when it was popping mm -hmm. and I was hearing all these good things about it, I was too young to get in. But I just need to let you know, like, oh, I heard so many good stories. I kept thinking, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. And then all of a sudden, yeah, they're like, it ain't like it used to be. And I'm like, well, now, yeah. <laughs> now I can finally go no. and I can't get. Yeah. <laughs> but I heard so many good things, <laughs> like yeah, legendary status in Kalamazoo for sure. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was it was a goal of mine to make it a, a truly a fun place, a safe place for people to come hang out on a Tuesday night. You know, when the owner of the clubs proposed the whole thing and I was like, he goes, what night do you want? And I go, 
you know what, just give me a Tuesday. I don't need a weekend night because I don't want to compete against people going, you know, out of town, going to Grand Rapids, going mm-hmm. to Detroit, going to Chicago. Give me a Tuesday where it's it's more likely that people stay in, you know, they're here in town and they're going to come check us out. And that was what we always try to give them was a good show every week. I um, always brought in, you know, guest DJs. Cause that's another thing I've never been afraid of putting somebody else on. I actually, I, that's what you're supposed to do. Just like how DJs are supposed to break music mm. as me being basically kind of, like I said, being the promoter, I'm supposed to break the DJs, let them get a chance to as well and pay them, you know, mm. again, not doing it for clout. I, I paid everybody. That's one thing you would never hear about Eric is that, that, that he didn't pay. Mm. Oh, I always paid. I took care of all my, my friends. And so that's what I did. But yeah, it was always a good experience. I'd like, you know, every now and then it would get a little wild, but it was nothing that was super crazy. So it just, I mean, I wanted to have a good time, have people be safe and enjoy themselves. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, man, you had mentioned like how we're right in between Detroit and Chicago and how we had like the best of both those scenes. And I remember uh, my grandfather. Mm-hmm. Uh, was in Chicago and so sometimes I would go up there summers like mm, this had mm-hmm. to be like early 90s and they had like that one <laughs> hip hop station for a couple years I don't remember like what happened to it. it ended up getting shut down but man I was recording so much stuff because like you said we just didn't really have it here <laughs> but I do that I remember I got my first uh, DJ Funk tape from Forest City Mall <laughs> <laughs> like one of them little bootleg kiosks <laughs> and yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's just something something about I, that flavor totally yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was because it was raw it was original it was and it you knew literally was some cats your age most likely do it making this music and they were doing it at home they were in some big multi-million dollar studio right. they had the equipment and they were making it happen and so that's what was cool about it and same thing Years of growing up um, back in Chicago, and the stations back in the day were WGCI and WBMX. And I mean, oh my God, they were classic stations. And, you know, they during the day, they played R&B and it was some hip hop. But at night, once it was like nine, 10 o'clock, when it was time to go out on the weekends, especially that house music would start and it wouldn't stop till three and four in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was definitely a great experience for sure. Yeah. And what I got my first, uh, well, I got, I think it was a CD. I actually had, I still have like the, the liner notes from it. I don't know who got my CD, but if I ever find out, they're going to be in trouble. But <laughs> I had that uh, Soul Tech that had like Chuck and Jit and all that on there. I went through so much to find it and finally found it at Flipside Records. I was so happy. But uh, yeah, I wore oh, that thing. You got to go CDs. <laughs> I see. I had the vinyl. Oh, see, that's so what's up. Stuff, I had all of that on vinyl, all of that. That's what's and up. And I remember buying, having to buy multiple copies of it because I hate to say it, it wasn't pressed on the best vinyl, mm-hmm. and we would literally wear the grooves out on the records. <laughs> um, so you you had to buy three and four copies of certain twelve inches because, especially the ones that were pressed locally, like I said in Detroit from Buy Right Records and and all of that, and then in Chicago there was so many different record stores and records places that just press their own stuff and the vinyl was not always the highest quality because usually a lot of it was recycled mm. and uh but yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that is brings back memories <laughs> yeah okay so you know with those memories and you know you being a veteran how do you balance uh playing what the crowd wants to hear and still introducing them to new stuff um, it's a tightrope for sure, um, but the, your job as a DJ is exactly that. It's, it's not just to play what you want. You, as a DJ, really should be, you know, like I said, breaking the new music. So yes, you're going to have those hits that people want to hear, and that's fine. Um, everything falls within a certain BPM range, whether it be hip hop or house, and you know that there's some new stuff that you need to start getting people's ears used to, and you just kind of enter splice it you know in the mix mm. and watch the crowd and see how they react and if they don't initially react to something um you pull it back come back to another potential hit or something like that but it is a balance and you've got to read the dance floor you really do 
need to pay attention. You might have a couple people walk off and you, and you blend the new song in. And, but if you start to see a large number of people kind of like, ah, I don't think I'm feeling it. Okay. You know, and I'll let's move on and, and you know, quick mix it if you need to out into to the next song that they do now, um, just to kind of bring them back around. Um, I can't tell you the number of times over the years, like I remember what was, I'm trying to think of one of the songs. Oh, heck, I, um, Brighter Days. I remember the first time playing Brighter Days and the dance floor looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> and they didn't like it. And I kind of played it in prime time because that's where I had originally heard it was in prime time. And I was like, oh, too prime time for them. They don't know the song. <laughs> So one of the things I did was in the next week, I played it again, but I played it earlier in the night where people hadn't really started dancing, mm. but then they got to hear the whole song and they kind of like, oh, okay, I like that. And then I did that a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden people were like, hey, what's that Brighter Day song? And all of a sudden I could push it towards that prime time part of the night. And so that's kind of how you do it. It's just, you, you talk to your crowd, you look, you know, that, that communication of watching how they react on the dance floor, but also just the communication of when they ask you to hear it. I want to hear this. Okay, let's see what I can do for you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is, a, it's a balance, but you gotta, that you have to be responsive um, to the request too, because I've been in, in places where DJs just play a pre-programmed set without really paying attention to the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time that doesn't work, you know, unless there's some super big name DJ where everybody is there just to see the DJ. Mm. Um, but otherwise, if you're there to dance and have a good time, you really don't care about who the DJ is. You really care about what they're playing. So that's how I always looked at it. Wow, man, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I've, I've been hearing a lot more DJ saying that they, you know, already decided what they're going to play. And, you know, they mm -hmm. kind of brag about having it pre-planned. <laughs> I mean, I do know a few that are still willing to mix some stuff up, you know, depending on how the crowd goes. But, yeah, just from kind of listening mm -hmm. and stuff, a lot aren't really open to doing that. So I think that that's really cool that even with all no. your experience, you know, um, you know, how to navigate. That. Oh, yeah, you've got to be flexible. Yeah, you've got to be flexible because, like I said, that pre-planned set, it, that crowd may not be vibing at that moment with, with what you think they should be vibing. And so you gotta, you still gotta win them over at the end of the day. You gotta win them over with, with the songs you're playing and, and with your choices. So you have to be flexible. I do some amount of, amount of preparation when I go to the DJ. I do have in mind what things I wanna play um, and where I think it might work, but I don't pre-plan an entire set at all for me. And that's just me. I, a lot of DJ, my DJ friends do, but then a lot of them are like me too, that will just kind of, they're going with the flow of what the vibe is at night. Um, Cause I've had where I'm literally have planned out, I'm, oh, I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna drop this on them. And yeah, none of that worked. And I was like, okay, let's get back to what, you know, this, this is working here. So let's see it. And, and just see what what they respond to because again you're you, you, they're there to hear the music ultimately i'm not a headliner type dj i'm just i'm the guy that's trying to play the good music for you and, and have, again have a good time so i have to be flexible now if i'm a headliner dj that's a little different um there's also some technical reasons why a lot of people um, pre-plan their sets because now there's even DJs and they've been doing this the last few years that actually pre-record their sets mm. and they actually are when they're up there DJing they're literally just playing pre-recorded on you know on the thumb drive the entire set and mm. just kind of switching between the two CDJs um, but they do it because they've got a light guide they've got a video guide it's one of the video screens and all of that and if it's all preset those graphics those lights all kind of are really more to what's being played wow. and that makes for a different experience but then when you're there to see a big name dj like that you're there for more of a concert light experience like experience as opposed to just there to dance okay. so that's why that happens because when i first saw a, pre a dj with a pre-recorded set i was very critical of it and once the dj because afterwards i had a conversation with them and they asked why did why are you doing that there's no soul in that. You're not reading the floor. Well, here's why. Because I'm putting on this entire show. It's not just the music. It's the light. It's the mm. graphics. It's everything. And I go, oh, okay. 
So does it work for me? No, I, that's not me. But yeah, there's people that do that. But like I said, I try to be prepared um, as best as possible, but I'm also prepared for any scenario. Okay. Um, you know, back to what you were saying about breaking records um, for any independent mm -hmm. artist that might be listening. Like, how do you determine what songs you might go ahead and kind of try to introduce within a mix? So, yeah, if there's an independent artist, I was like, you know what? I got this one track, you know, that, whether you're playing hip hop, house, whatever the case may be, uh, mm -hmm. what, what would be the criteria for you to consider it? So for me, um, it's kind of twofold. This one is, do I like it first off? Um, and then there's times where I, I, I listen to it um, when, because I'm one of those people that, you know, I remember when Sound, SoundCloud first launched and I was there because I was like, oh, we can kind of go directly to the artist and find things. I'm a big fan of Bandcamp. Um, that's another platform. Um, and so I go out and I just listen. Honestly, I listen, I listen, I listen. And then I, you know, I'm listening to it at home. I'll listen to the song in my car. Does it have the right sound? Does it, you know, does, does it bump? You know, <laughs> is it working? Um, but I also, I, I listen to it. I'll play it for friends. What do you think about this? You know, and see what their reactions are to the song. Um, and then, you know, kind of go from, go that route. And then I'll test songs out again, you know, sometimes early in the night, I'll play something to see. You know, if, the, if I at least get heads bobbing, you know, kind of, oh, okay, that works. Uh, but also then too, um, not, I'm not out there as much as I was, um, you know, because I, I kind of just haven't been, and I'm just kind of getting back in the plan again. But, um, you know, when I was always in a record pool of some sort, you know, we take that feedback as well from when you get music, hey, listen to this. And, and that's really the, the first, you know, thing is, is do I like the song? Is it is it something I would listen to on a normal basis? Um, now, granted, that doesn't always apply. There's been <laughs> tracks where I just like that that can't be a hit, and it becomes a hit, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I've got to play this. But you know, it it, it is ultimately at the end of the day, is is something I like. And then if I hear or if I hear uh, patrons at the club and stuff who are there to dance, they ask you about something you've never heard of. Them. Then I'll go and listen to it. I'll go back and I'll, you know, hey, I don't have it tonight, but let me look into it and see if I can find something, you know. And then if I, you know, check it out and I go, oh man, this is a hot track, you know. They were on to something, so I listen to, to my people too. So that's the other thing is, you know, if somebody asked me about, I'd heard of them, um, you know. I've got kind of a good network of people who do that too, who also just send me stuff and say, hey, hey, check this out. This is something I heard. You might like it. So it's kind of, you know, broad range. So I would always tell any artist starting out, um, yeah, put yourself out there. Put yourself on Bandcamp, Mixcloud, any of those platforms. Um, you know, Bandcamp preferably because at least you can make some money off of it. Um, I'm, all, I'm always for someone getting paid for their their product and for their, you know, their artistry and talent. So I'm, I'm still buying music right to this day, you know. Um, so yeah, be able to put yourself out there, be able to market yourself and you, cause you gotta get people's attention and you also gotta get the DJ's attention as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of my, my hints and, and, you know, advice. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, you said you're just now kind of getting back out there. I know recently you did a show with, uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, could you tell us about some of yeah. the highlights from that? How did it feel kind of getting back out there playing <laughs> together again? It was a long night. It was fun. It was just me and Mr. Harris. And it was from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Sorry, to 2 a.m. Wow. And that's a long night for us going back and forth. Um, but it was a good night. Uh, we had a really good turnout. Um, and it was, I was, I was tired at the end of it. But I honestly, I was very, um, um, happy with with the the turnout we had and the feedback we got um, so much so that actually myself, Mr. Harris, and then our other partner, uh, DJ Kaz, we're going to relaunch our Real Radio PHX um, website dot com um, and start back up in January of doing our um, we, we used to do a weekly show um, on you know we were always we kind of laughing like we were ahead of the curve because we were streaming back in 2010 2011 
um, <laughs> on a platform called Ustream. Um, and so oh. we're like, oh, now we got Twitch. <laughs> so we're going to start that back up. But yeah, it was it was a great night. Um, we had some repeat customers because we had played the last gig before that that we got Sherman, Mr. Harris and I played previous was about a year previous for our birthday. And um, we had a lot of a year ago that came back and we were like, whoa, you, <laughs> yeah, we were here the last time you played and we saw that you were playing again. We're like, that was wild. I don't oh, think I've so. ever, you know, followed back up with somebody a year later on a gig. <laughs> so that was impressive for us too. And we, we really liked that. We were like, oh, okay. And it gave us some time to say, hey, maybe we should relaunch this real radio PHX thing. And um, so that's what we're looking at doing. But yeah, it was a good, good time overall. Um, and I'm doing some other little small gigs here and there. Um, coming up here in the Phoenix area, um, and our, my buddy has a nightclub it's called Solstice, and it's downtown Phoenix. So I'm going to be playing there in the coming weeks as well. So just again, getting back out there, like I said, it's one of those things where it just never it never leaves you. Um, once you're out there playing and DJing and even performing, whatever you are as an artist, you know that it's, it never leaves you. So you know I might have stepped away and took a break. It's always there, so I'm excited for that. I love that. So, okay, you know, uh, since time's kind of winding down and you got this stuff coming up, where should people be connecting with you to make sure that they can see what you've got going on? I know I'll do my part to make sure I can share what I can, but yeah, where where should they check you out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so honestly, um, I'm on Instagram, DJ E House. I'm on Mixcloud, again, DJ E House. Um, so that's the two platforms really I'm on at this moment. Um, we haven't relaunched the web yet for realradiophx.com just yet. We're still um, working on that. Um, we still own the domain, luckily. We, we just got to gotta find a new web host. Uh, so yeah, but Mixcloud and, and, and Instagram are the easiest and the best ways to reach me. And I'm there. Okay. Well, I hope that I get to have you back on the show uh, sometime before then. So that way we can kind of remind people that you got that yeah. coming up. Oh, for sure. Maybe we can get all three of us together. I would love Myself, it. Mr. Harris, and like I said, the DJ Cass. Um, we, we can kind of get in there and talk with you and kind of hype it up, you know, what's coming up uh, for us in the future. Because like I said, we're shooting for a January launch. So that's, that's kind of the plan. So we're working behind the scenes right now to get all of our, our technical stuff uh, together equipment wise and all of that so yeah for sure i'll reach out to you and let you know absolutely. what's going on great because yeah you guys absolutely have access to my platform when you need it so yep just keep me informed and so yeah before we go ahead and close out um are there any i guess lasting thoughts you might want to leave for any aspiring djs <laughs> or some you know that that don't quite have as much uh juice behind them as you do but they're they're working on building it <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I think I even said this in our last time we spoke was don't be afraid to put in the work. Don't expect to come out the gate, you know, playing a, a, a big room. You know, you're going to start out in some smaller places, put in that work, uh, put in that what we call it. I call it the 10,000 hours. Um, get your craft right. You know, I've seen a lot of ki kids, you know, their bedrooms DJing and they really, they weren't ready to come out their bed. Mm. Uh, and they just need to come out prepared, even when you're playing a small venue. Um, so that's the thing is practice, practice, practice. Um, if you're an artist, make sure you're doing your rehearsing. And I say rehearse a lot. Um, even, you know, as a DJ, I don't do it as much as I used to. But when I was working constantly um, DJing, I was still, I was even rehearsing DJing just to make sure my skills were, were home. So I was doing that at least one to two hours a week in between gigs, after work, whatever. I was just playing some songs, seeing what works, things like that. So, you know, for these days, make sure you're practicing, you know, for if you're an artist, be rehearsing. Because, um, you know, if you talk to some of these big rock stars and, and R&B artists um, that play guitar, that play the drums, that they'll tell you, they rehearse still. Even though they're accomplished and at the top of their game, they rehearse. So just be prepared because whenever you get that phone call, you need to be prepared to go out there and kill it because that's what's going to get you noticed is that you came out 
swinging and that, oh man that cat was dope you know that dj was off the chain because they came out prepared and they actually you, you should never know that you, you this is your first gig out of the bedroom it should sound like you've been doing this for a long time so that would be my advice mm, some gems right there thank you so much really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom and experience with us and so yeah like i said just let me know i'd love to have you back again have all three of you and yeah i just yeah. really appreciate you well i appreciate you having me on and talking with you today i had a good time with with the conversation it was easy <laughs> so thank you so much for having me on <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. And that's a wrap for this episode of Instrumental Intel. I've been your host, music producer, Chick with Beats. I want to thank you for listening and tuning in. I want to thank my guest, E House, for sharing his knowledge, wisdom, and experience with us. I want to thank my home station, Grander Radio, out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm already excited to come back next week. I have Ultra Mag 7 joining me to talk about visual storytelling and hip hop via culture clips. So it's going to be a great time. Make sure that you come back and check that out. So till next time, you know where to find me. Tune in, tell a friend. I'll see you then. Peace.